Whatever you have experienced as a child, there is deep psychological healing you can do as an adult. All of us, to a greater or lesser extent, who have struggled more with our psychological well-being as adults, are processing often some kind of childhood trauma. Healthcare is still split mind and body. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with The Megaverse. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome the amazing Rachel Kelly to the show best-selling writer, mental health advocate, and ambassador for Rethink Mental Illness and Head Talks. Rachel is here to share her insights on mental well-being. With a journey through depression documented in her books and a holistic approach to staying calm and well, Rachel brings a wealth of wisdom. Her latest book, You'll Never Walk Alone, Poems for Life, Sups and Downs, is a testament to her resilience and commitment to breaking mental health stigmas. Get ready for an uplifting conversation as Rachel dives into her motivational and evidence-based strategies. It's time to break down stigmas, embrace wellness, and find inspiration in every step of life's journey. And Rachel reminds us that we're never alone in this crazy ride called life. Cue the music. Megaverse, the digital frontier of tomorrow. Megaverse stands at the cutting edge intersection of technology and imagination. It's a virtual realm where the limitless expanse of the digital universe unfolds, offering users unparalleled experiences and interactions. With its advanced metaverse platform, users can craft unique avatars, forge connections, and even establish their own digital estates. It's more than just virtual reality. Megaverse is an expansive digital civilization teeming with opportunities for both individuals and brands. From immersive concerts to revolutionary retail experiences, Megaverse is redefining the way we engage with the digital world. As we stand on the brink of a new era where the lines between our physical reality and the digital realm blur, Megaverse is poised to lead the charge in this brave new world. Dive in and discover a universe without bounds. This really is the future. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for coming to join us on the podcast today. My total pleasure. Let's, you don't know my journey into depression, although my audience know my journey. They're probably sick of hearing it. I've told it so many times. Mm. But I want to talk about the challenges that people face. And I, and, and I think there are people out there that are really struggling Mm-hmm. but don't really know how to compartmentalize the struggle sometimes that they have. It's given such a, a an easy name, you know, it's just depression or, you know, when you're really depressed. No, no, it's, it's sadness, then it's depression, then it's, well, it's clinical depression now because a doctor's told you you need to take some, uh, some medication to try and cope with it. But I think a lot of people, um, if they're lonely, don't know if they're depressed. Mm-hmm. Um and loneliness for me is one of the worst things anybody could possibly be. But what I want everyone that's watching and listening right now to understand is the pain that you went through on your journey and when you first recognised that it was something other than just feeling down. Sure. Uh, Freud's got a good phrase, actually. He talks about ordinary human unhappiness. And it is a big issue, this question of, you know, diagnosis and to what extent is it just ordinary human unhappiness or is there something very serious and a a, a profound uh, problem? I think in my case, in some ways, I was quite lucky because it was so dramatic and I was so unwell that I didn't really have a choice um, in terms of recognising that there was something really, really dark and difficult that was happening. And um, basically, I, I, I was working in the newsroom at The Times And it was an exciting job, but quite a stressful job. And my husband worked in finance. And I always think when you're thinking about your psychological health, you need to think about the context. So what else is happening in the family? I had two small children. And my own journey into severe illness really started with insomnia. Um, So I was lying awake and it was a little thing really. And that might sound odd because if I told you that It was just that that particular night, my husband said to me, you're listening out for the baby. Well, wasn't a baby. George was a bit older than that. He was about six months. But you're listening out for him tonight. Doesn't sound like a big deal. I'd listened out for him in the night before. 
But something about that night was different and that sense of responsibility. So I lay there listening out and I just couldn't get sleep. But with this insomnia started to come some quite alarming physical symptoms and my heart rate speeded up. It's a bit like, um, I don't know if you know that thing when you've got a wash, uh, like a shoe, a gym shoe in the washing machine and it's kind of going thump, thump, mm -hmm. thump. It was almost like my heart was going to like jump out of my rib cage. Uh, so that was quite worrying. And I remember also I felt very nauseous, like I had to throw up, but I didn't actually throw up. And I also had a very nasty feeling, which again is going to sound really odd, but I felt like I was falling. So I was like gripping the bed and my mind was absolutely racing around. And basically my thoughts went, oh my God, if I don't get to sleep, I can't get to work. If I can't get to work, I can lose my job. If I can lose the job, we'll lose the house. Uh, you know, uh, children going to care. This kind of thinking is known as catastrophic, which I later discovered. But again, I didn't know that. And I think it's very interesting how quickly your mind can spiral. This was all in a matter of minutes. But basically, I kept going. I couldn't get to sleep. These symptoms were getting worse and worse and worse. But I was supposedly quite the kind of high-functioning type. So the next morning, even though I was feeling really ill, like seriously ill, I thought, okay, you know, refasten activity to its normal time normal timetable. I'll breakfast at breakfast time, I'll lunch at lunchtime, I'll dine at dinner time, and I'll just get back to my busy working life, you know, keep calm, carry on. But unfortunately, all these symptoms got worse and worse. And after another night of total insomnia, another night of this racing heart, this nausea, this horrible feeling of falling, these racing thoughts, I found myself in hospital. And um, I thought I was having a heart attack, actually. And the doctor sat me down and I said, oh, I imagine you're a cardiologist. And he said, no, he said, I'm a psychiatrist. And I said, oh, I don't, no, 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 that's a mistake. And he said, well, he said, these are really classic signs of a sort of a major anxiety-driven depressive episode. So at the time, I was in such a bad way, I didn't really understand, but I later discovered that You'll have heard of the fear, fight or fright instinct. So all those symptoms which prepare you for a threat. So you'd see the lion across the savannah. So you, you know, your heart would race so the bump, blood would pump that bit faster so you could run a bit faster. You'd empty your stomach so you'd get away from the threat. Your mind would be racing but in a good way to kind of grip the situation. That's all fine as a short-term response to a major threat. But if it becomes chronic, i.e. ongoing, and your body doesn't get out of it, you can begin to feel incredibly ill. And, and that's what happened to me. Um, and then I was in a psychiatric hospital and that was the start of a very serious depressive episode. The start? Well, I mean, I was given a lot of drugs, uh, which is still the main approach to severe depression. Obviously there's, there's the therapeutic approach. Uh, so this, this was back, I was in my 30s, so we're, we're, we're quite a while ago now. So therapy wasn't so sort of big as it is now, but drugs was the main approach. Now, drugs is a big topic, and I reacted quite badly to a lot of the drugs. And it was really hard to know what was going on, because was it this very severe reaction that I'd had to this sort of overwhelm, this stress, the children, the, the demanding job... Was it the drug? So I was given sleeping pills to sort of help with the insomnia. I was given initially anti-anxiety medication. I didn't jump straight to antidepressants. So those are your benzodiazepines. So they're your things like your Valium and um, diazepam to sort of bring down the anxiety. Um, and basically none of it was working. In, in a funny way, I was getting even more anxious because I don't know if you've been in a psychiatric hospital, but they're not the, the nicest places. And I was in a complete state about being in this room where everything was taken away from me. I was being checked through the night with, you know, woken up, seemed to me, even though I couldn't sleep and the windows were jammed and all of that. And um, I was just getting iller and iller and quite soon I was suicidal. Yeah, and it was odd because there was the bit of my brain that knew I had a pretty good life. You know, I've got a super husband, two gorgeous kids. I had a great job. You know, he was working for Goldman Sachs. It's a pretty cool job. You know, we had a great life. But I'd just had enough because I felt so unwell. The pain, and I was screaming. 
And I was saying, you know, I want to die, I want to die. I just had enough. And then I'd be given more, you know, medication to bring me back down. And then I started on, on antidepressants, but the kind that bring you down. So you'll know they're different kinds. There's the kind of like the Bro Prozacs, which cheer you up. And then my one was quite an old-fashioned one, actually, which is it was, it was called Prothada, and it's not really prescribed now because it, there is a suicide risk with it. Um, but it, it, it kind of, it brings you down. But I'm really small, as you probably see, and a lot of these drugs aren't tested on women. So the dose they were giving me, I, I, I mean, I could be out cold for 14 hours. I was just, I was completely being sedated. And then I'd wake up again like this crazy woman and they were trying to adjust the drugs. So they're trying to get the drugs so that the anxiety came down to a level that I was more or less functioning, but not completely knocked out. And that intense period of sort of fiddling with the drugs in this very extreme state probably took about six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Um, but it felt like a lifetime. It was such a terrifying period. Um, yeah, so it, it did get worse. I, I can hardly believe that it got worse, but it did actually get worse. Um, but I did get out of hospital soon because I was very lucky. I, I, I was being treated privately and I had a psychiatrist who understood that it was making me worse to be in hospital. But my mum moved in and I had to have 24 hour sort of surveillance. Um, and I didn't plan to kill myself. I think in the end, having my two children was what I had a reason to keep going. <coughs> but, um, you know, they were careful not to let the, you know, someone had to give me the medication and not leave the medication next to my bed in case I just got into one of these terrifying moments when I just felt so ill. What year was this? So this is back in 97. So this is the Blair, Blair landslide <coughs> election. You're probably too young for that. Well, I'm 53, so... You look very young. <laughs> yeah, so it was the Blair. I'm old, yeah, I'm it was older the, than you, so. Yeah. No, you're not older than me. I'm 58. Behave. Oh, stop. Naughty. How old are you? 58. Are you really? Yeah, I am. You rock 58. You say that to all the girls. That's what you want me to say. You want to say that because it makes you feel, feel better. You know, that's not the truth. Well, if I look well now, it's because this horrible thing that happened to me, because that <clears> happened, <throat> that was the first episode. I got better. Then I had a second one, even worse, for two years. But basically, the blessing of what happened is that I have spent 10 to 15 years figuring out what, what helps. And I am on top of the world. 1997, this experience you go through... Yeah. Teaches you a lot about yourself. Not at the time. Since. First time round, I shut the whole topic down. So remember, we're back in 97, so it's got quite a while ago. I'm in my 30s, I'm in my 50s now, as we've established, even though you're being very tactful. Um, <laughs> the point was, stigma was really big then. Especially... So tell, tell me back in 197, for the benefit of the younger people consuming this content now, how, how was that kind of stuff seen back in the 90s? Oh, well, <clears throat> in my world, so my world, I would describe myself as professional. So professional journalist, married to a professional banker, hardworking, you know, good at school, went to Oxford, ticked lots of boxes. I would say, in terms of stigma... There was an understanding that if you suffered real social deprivation, basically you were on the wrong side of the tracks, you might be depressed. You know, you, you lived in a rubbish council flat, et cetera, et cetera. There was also the beginning of celebrity depression, by which I mean fancy pop stars who had ups and downs, you know, maybe a bit artistic, creative. Yeah, they might be a bit, you know, up and down because they've got this kind of crazy life. This middle section where I put myself, the doctors, the lawyers, the bankers, the accountants, it was not a topic. So I was working in the newsroom. I told my news editor, obviously, because I was off work for six months. But after that, just shut the topic down. It wasn't something that was talked about, certainly not in a corporate context. I mean, amazingly, I had been, I was so ill. Did I get therapy? No. I just went straight back to work. Did I do anything to change my lifestyle? 
No. I just thought, oh, I've been really ill. You know, it was just a one-off. Almost like... I mean, this sounds a bit strong, but almost like I didn't... At that stage in my own psychological journey, I didn't really feel it was sort of... I, I was worth sort of making an effort and thinking, why the hell has this happened to me? I just sort of sort of accepted it, really. Sounds weird. When I look back on it, I think, what was I doing just to think that that was OK? But I did, and I, I went back, quite the busy bee in the newsroom, you know, Stiff working. Stiff upper lip and all that. Totally, and didn't talk about it. My husband didn't really talk about it. Um, though, funnily enough, Goldman were really good, and they said, go home, look after your wife. Uh, of course, he didn't actually do that uh, completely. But, uh, yeah, it, 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 I mean, the context has really completely changed. Um, do you think you talk about it in a very matter-of-fact way now? Well, I think what happened to me was that the blessing was that it happened again. I, I mean, I wouldn't be involved in mental health you know, it's my life now. I wouldn't be doing it if I hadn't had that second episode. And that second episode, it was just so long. Two years, I don't know if you can think, but that is a bloody long time to be unwell. And I know it was two years because I didn't do a school run for two years. So any parents listening, you really mind if you don't do the school run. And I just thought, OK, I'm getting the message now. I'm getting the message. I've got to do something here. You know, why was I so ill? What was going on? And what is it about me? And what is it about a certain kind of driven, sort of um, ambitious, um, multitasking type who doesn't really prioritise themselves? Um, and it's, what are we now? I mean, so that second episode was 2003, 4, 5, 6. So it's been a long, long journey to get to the point that, you know, you, you very kindly said I look well. I think it's really the last three or four years that I think I've really got to grips with my own sort of psychic drama, if that makes sense. Let me try and put this into some form of corporate context here because leadership, you, t you generally find the entrepreneurs or people that are business owners are carrying... Uh, the weight on their shoulders of the whole business and their employees plus the families of their employees as well. So there's big responsibilities. But even people that are managing teams in C-suite positions in businesses have um, maybe somewhat of a different dynamic to the people on the shop floor. Sure. When you're in, <clears throat> when you're in a leadership position in that type of role, how difficult is it to identify that there are there could be people in in your organisation or your group of people that could be facing similar challenges that you had? Well, just before we come to that, I, I think it's a really interesting area, that idea of sort of enmeshment and to what extent are you responsible for people? And I get the idea, and, you know, I managed a small team at the time, so I, I understand the idea of feeling responsible for employees I think it's a really interesting area about how do you support people and be alongside them while keeping your own inner calm as somebody in charge and not being overly responsible and over-rescuing people who are working for you. I mean, maybe that's something we can come back to because I think that's been a big journey for me about realising that for all of us, our main relationship is with ourselves. So if you're a person in a position of responsibility for other people's well-being, you've got to get your own house in order first and you've got to have a, a nurturing and nourishing and calm relationship with yourself whereby you're not overly, you, you know, I, I like the word enmeshed, you're not overly bleeding your feelings and other people's feelings. You've got to have some boundaries. To your point about how can you figure out if people around you are in trouble, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. I think the simplest answer is that if you are in psychological distress and if you look at something like the diagnostic DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical 
I think it's at the Diagnostical Statistical Manual. It's the American book which basically puts symptoms in two different psychological disorders, mood disorders. There are a lot of physical symptoms. So there are some psychological cognitive symptoms like an inability to concentrate or a feeling of overwhelm, but there are physical symptoms. And so in my case, there was that insomnia. So almost certainly someone who's beginning to be in the foothills of a problem will have some kind of physical manifestation of that. They might have a digestive problem. You know, I had it a very extreme thing, this constant nausea. But again, that might be a, a sign. Now, given that the stigma is still around, amazingly, you would think with all the talk, in this particular middle section that I keep talking about, it is alive and well. And I work with law firms and banks. And what happens if you do a presentation is at the end of the presentation, people come around and say, actually, I didn't want to say in front of everybody, but I'm finding this or I'm finding that. So given the stigma, I would say that the good way for somebody in charge is to say, have you got any physical symptoms? You know, you're looking a little tired. Are you having trouble sleeping? And that can be a way to open up a conversation. Mm. Because there isn't so much stigma about having a, you know, a poorly tummy. But if it's starting to be about your very existence and your psychological state of mind, we're in much trickier territory. Mm. Okay. Let's go back to the other point you mentioned, because I think we need to deal with that one, because as you said, it, it became very pertinent to me. Working on yourself, getting your own house in order. Mm -hmm. Such an important thing to say because it's it's very easy to spend your time looking at others and thinking what you can do to improve them, but mm -hmm. we don't take the medicine ourselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your situation, it was extreme. Mm -hmm. Others will have had situations that maybe aren't as extreme, mm -hmm. maybe not identified fully what they have. Mm -hmm. just ups and downs, it's life type of thing. Because they maybe come from a, a family where stiff upper lip was what was the order of the day, dust yourself down, roll your sleeves back up and let's crack on type of my, my mentality. Sure. What kind of questions can people ask themselves to get their own house in order or to give themselves just a bit of a check rather than going... Because you find there's some people that are happy to go and talk to somebody, but many people aren't because mm -hmm. they don't even realise why they would even need to talk to somebody. That's a really good question. I think that um, the starting point for me in terms of, as you say, getting my own house in order was I wanted more. I was asking for more. And I think an awful lot of people can ask for more. They can have a better life. They can have a calmer life. I'm not saying that there won't be moments of sadness and difficulty because obviously that is part of life. But even there, you can shift how you think about that, that no experience is without value. And I think that wanting more and wanting to feel well, to feel calm, to feel relaxed, which I had never really experienced ever since I was a little girl, I was forever the anxious driver, ticking boxes, getting to the tops of trees, you know, passing, you know, A star, this, A star, that, all the rest of it. And I just had enough of being that person and I wanted more. And I wanted a, a, a more easeful life. I think that's the word I love, easeful. It's just an easier life. Um, and it's more fun. And lining up with what's fun and lining up with what I enjoyed and it all sounds so obvious, but I had to do a lot of work to pivot away from my previous sets of premises, really, about the world and a whole series of mindsets, which I think are very common for a certain kind of driven, high-functioning, supposedly competitive, professional type of person. I'll give you one big bit of work that I've done. So I would say till after the second major depressive episode, 
I always needed outside praise, always needed outside affirmation. I was the good girl and I wanted people to tell me that. And I wanted someone to pat me on the head. You know, I needed my editor at the time to say, oh, brilliant article. You know, I needed, you know, fantastic reviews when I wrote my books. I needed to be in the bestseller lists. It was always looking for outward affirmation. Now, if you think about it, that is an incredibly stressful way to live. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can do to control what anybody else thinks about me. And I sit here now and I look you in the eye and I think, you know what? The only person who can affirm me is me. Mm -hmm. The only person that really matters. If I think I'm good enough, I'm good enough. So that's a kind of example of a big shift in mindset, which, I mean, it's just so relaxing, isn't it? Mm. You know, I mean, it's sort of like, great. I've got agency. I'm in charge. If I think I'm okay and I've done a good job, that's all that matters. What, what, what role does maturity play in that as well, though? Because if you go through the different phases in life, you know, the 19-year-old or the 20-year-old who's starting in their career, it's 100 miles an hour at work, it's 100 miles an hour at the pub, 100 miles an hour on the squash court, you know, it's, it's all 100 miles an oh, hour. yeah. And then you go into that phase of, you know, and men and women see it differently, I think, the whole kind of like marriage and having babies and, you know, the, the idea of having a baby is a lovely thing and then a baby comes along and no matter how many people have spoken to you about it, nobody warned you about that. Um, and then you go from that phase to the husband after a couple of years of being a dad to toddlers, wanting to get focused on his career because that's important and that brings the money through the front door um, to, the, to, the, to the place where you get into your 40s and your kids are a little bit older and less hassle and you know more fun, I suppose, and uh, off with their own social lives as well, um, where... You look back at some of the things that you did along the way and you're like, why was I even interested in that? You know, that doesn't sound like fun at all because your kids are now doing that kind of stuff. And you're like, why would you do that? Um, but it's true. Yeah. And then yeah, you, get, yeah. you get to the next phase of your life, which is the bit that you're talking about now. In my mind, it, you know, I'm 53. You're a little bit younger than me. But it's like <laughs> that calm has been something that I've enjoyed over the last three or four years. It's been nice to be calm, but I, I put it down to because that's the stage of life I'm at. If you'd have taught me or I'd have learned or I'd have been you know, committed to being calm in that way in my early 20s, you might have you know, um, put the water on the flames of the fire that was in my belly. Well, let's tease these things out. I, I, don't, I don't see it as either or. If I had my time again, I mean, I am uh, such a cliche, living my best life. But I mean, literally every morning, can't wait to get up. Uh, and I do have this ease and I am relaxed and I don't need all these outward affirmations, et cetera, et cetera. If I could have had that, you know, back in the day when I was sort of 19, 20, starting out on my busy, busy, successful career. Fabulous, because I don't see that that means that you can't also be driven and competitive and wish the best for yourself, but you're doing it from an internal point of view, lining up with what you want and what you enjoy and what makes things fun for you as opposed to somebody else's agenda. And, you know, I had a pretty successful career and I still think I have a great career, but who's to say I feel my career is just starting? I mean, now I'm able to really line up with what I want to do, what I'm good at. You know, I mean, the sky's the limit. So, as I said to you a little bit, like, why did I start all this therapeutic journey? What more is possible? What more could I want? So I don't think it's either or. I think anybody young listening to this show, if you can readjust and throw off some of these sort of society society's premises, what I, the way I would look at it. So, for example talked a bit about outward affirmation. I tell you another one, which I was hugely a kind of had bought into, which I don't believe anymore. The scarcity narrative. It's everywhere. Hurry, hurry while stocks last. Hurry, hurry. There's not enough time. I don't believe that. I believe there's absolutely enough time to do what you want to do. And you don't have to buy into be other people's agendas of, you know, deadlines and scarcity and what you have to do, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I suppose have it all. But does that not come down to a couple of things there that you've spoken about now? It's like when you describe 
the constant requirement for affirmation. Yeah. That's definitely something that's daddy or mummy issues when you're young, isn't it? One in one in their approval as a kid, you know. Sure. It's very obvious that is and being a straight A student and getting into Oxford means you had a phenomenal education along the way, driven by your desire to make somebody more happier than you with the work that you were doing. Sure. Would that be fair? Yeah, no, look, you've, you've, uh, you're maybe in another life, you should be a therapist. <laughs> but I, I actually did some very powerful Just work. Just want to stop there for a second, folks. So if my wife is listening to this right now. <laughs> she might not agree. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I, but I even, well, I suppose what I would say is that I have done some very powerful work myself about looking back at that anxious five, six-year-old and I'm a really big believer in sort of quite deep somatic energetic work, uh, by which I mean that I can go into a sort of a dropped consciousness state using some of the deep breathing in a very practical way to drop down and to bring back a memory of me as a child and to talk to that child and just say, you're OK, you're good enough. You don't have to ace all these exams to be lovable you're lovable anyway and in a very profound way to sort of integrate that younger self and you know the teenage self and the tick the box self and the ace it in the times room newsroom self and say you're okay you're lovable anyway you know you'll know that from your kids you don't love them for what they've done you just love them anyway and I'm sure my parents my dad is still alive at 90. I think they did love me. I'm not even sure whether I internalised this not good enough story. I, I think it may be too simplistic to think that somehow how they were made me how I was. I, I don't even really know. I don't even think it matters. In fact, I've become increasingly interested in the idea that the reasons why we can spend a lot of time with them and it may be a complete waste of time. We don't necessarily know why we've ended up in our in our sort of psychic mix that we are as individuals. But that's not to say that we can't go back with compassion and nurturing and nourishing and and, and just bring all the, all our earlier selves. OK, but when, when I'm... OK, let me take me as an example here and, and because I think it has a lot to do with all of these things because if you look at my situation and my problems over the years, mm-hmm. uh, self-diagnosed... Um, which I'm not sure what the value of that is. But when I look at my problems over the years, my parents got divorced. My dad went bankrupt when I was seven years old. Parents got divorced. Dad went overseas to live in another... Well, he first of all moved out and went somewhere else about an hour down the road, but then he moved overseas. Um, He would come and pick me up on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock. And if he was five minutes late, five minutes... This is obviously before telephones and mobiles and stuff like that. He was five minutes late. Those five minutes, all I thought was he's not coming. Mm, that's really hard so, so I had this deep sense of abandonment yeah. from from my hero yeah. now as an adult I know why he did it and it's uh, it's obvious and I fully respect that and and I, and I see he had he had to make the choices he made and that none of them are bad as an adult looking at it but as a 7 year old mm. my dad doesn't love me mm. as a 7 year old I'm not important to my dad mm-hmm. in that phase and so I I have, I've over the years had terrible trouble ending relationships. Mm. And then people say to me, well, if it's not working, why don't you just end it? And it's like, yeah, because the thought of abandoning someone. Mm. So painful. It, it impacts me so much. The thought of creating that pain for somebody else mm. um, and allowing them to live through what I lived through as a child and them to live through it now, it's just, it, it, it's, it's almost torture to me to think I'd ever do that to somebody. Mm. And so relationships have ended because they've left because the situation was untenable, but at least it wasn't me that left them. Yeah. You know? And so the reason I talk about that is that I, I start to lean into the challenges I've faced um, over the years, you know, bullying so I was bullied by Paul Fowler and Justin Zimmerman. Mm. Okay, I know them. I never since since the day I left school at sixteen. I've never I saw them once. Saw one of them once, um, but I've never seen them. Mm. 
I don't know where they live. I don't know. I don't know anyone from school, really, if I'm honest with you, maybe one or two people. But they still have such a profound impact on me. And my career success in sales came because of them. Mm. Because for 30 years, I was still Can trying to go, you? fuck you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you. And it, was like, and, and it wasn't a, a gentle, it was a very, very powerful driver for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I need to show these guys, that these kids that beat me up and bullied me and threw me in the dustbins and stuff. I need oh, to prove to them. Yeah. I, don't, I don't worry about it now. But I need to prove to them. Mm-hmm. And, and I had one situation at a set of traffic lights one night over in Essex when I was there by chance in a nice car and somebody pulled up on a moped alongside me looked in the window he had a crash helmet on I didn't he asked me to wind the window down I wound the window down and it was Justin Zimmerman gosh and he's like I love your car how you do you know and there was this one moment where we spoke for three minutes and he was a different person. He was humble and, you know, blown away by my whatever success he thought I had. I was only in my early 20s. But that was like, that was an important point in my kind of recovery and repair of I'll show you. So now I've shown you. So I felt a bit better about it. But it yeah. still wasn't enough. So, and again, the reason I talk about these things is that I find all of these things linked to a part or a picture or a an experience that took place at some point in my early years Mm -hmm. that made me the person that I was. You know, when when I first started making a a lot of money, um, I was incredibly generous with that money. Mm -hmm. And my mum said, be careful, you're like your dad. And I went, what do you mean? She said, your dad was always the most generous person. Mm. He was always buying the drinks. He was always doing this. He was always, he'd pay for dinner for everyone. That's, That's your dad. Don't be like your dad because that's one of the reasons he went bankrupt. Mm. And it was like, whoa, you yeah. know. And so, and whether they're attaching or I'm attaching, or goodness knows, somebody else out there is attaching. I don't know, but I seem to find that. And when I hear your story, it seems seems so easy for me. And it's very wrong of me, by the way. So I'll, I'll put put that now in there. It's very easy for me to go. Well, clearly, you needed to to get praise from somebody. Yes. Yes. Look. What you say makes total sense. I I totally agree that all of us, to greater or lesser extent, are processing often some kind of childhood trauma. When I say all of us, all of us who have struggled more with our psychological well-being as adults. And I think that was also true for me to an extent. But what I would say is that, you know, we're in our 50s now. We don't, we're no longer, you're not the seven-year-old waiting for your dad. I'm not the whatever, six-year-old wanting my mum to say, you know, well done at school. And and I, it's funny you mention that because I do remember, I remember I always used to ace all my exams and she didn't seem to respond. So I thought, okay, I'll tell her that I failed everything and see if that has more impact. And <laughs> she didn't respond <laughs> either. Oh, really? Yeah, so I, I I tried it different ways. So, look, I think there was that that very anxious child. I didn't child. get both options because I failed everything. Oh, well, you know, well, you know, it didn't do me any good. Look what happened to me, you know, supposedly. Anyway. Sorry. But, but my point being that whatever you have experienced as a child, I am really, really confident that there is deep psychological healing you can do as an adult to, at the simplest cognitive level, to acknowledge that whatever stories you told yourself when you were younger, they were stories. They were thoughts. You created narratives. And it may or may or not have reflected the reality. Maybe my mum thought I was just absolutely terrific. In fact, funnily enough, I think she did. I now think she did. She was of background and culture that was very sort of low-key. So she wasn't going to say you're the tip-top Tower of Pisa, Mona Lisa type. She just wasn't that sort of woman. I internalised this narrative of not good enough and anxious striving and tick more boxes, et cetera, et cetera. But I acknowledge it now as, as a narrative. It's a story I told myself. It doesn't necessarily mean to say it was true. It's just how I chose at that time. But to- isn't that so important? Because my dad not picking me up, I'll be in five minutes late. Yes. My dad was stuck at a set of traffic lights. My dad didn't have in his head, I was late. Right, so yeah, you can change. I created that story, yeah, yes. which, which obviously I can change that now. But, but at that time, it was profound. If you and I are husband and wife, we can That'd both... That'd be nice. <laughs> 
<laughs> we can both view the same thing with a different set of eyes. I quite agree. And it can be, you know, one of our kids, let's say, hypothetically, that has a problem with something. In my brain, I'm like, that's no problem. In your brain, my goodness, that's a big problem. Yeah, it's like some people and love it's... tarantulas and other people think they're the scariest thing. Some people have them as pets, you know. That's yeah. just such a nice way of realising it's how different people choose to respond to circumstances. So with with that in mind, because then everything, everything is on the table now, isn't it? Everything is on the table and what open, do you mean? open to question. Yes, what you mean all the stories you've been everything, telling yourself. Everything. Yes, but what I would go on to say is I don't think the questioning of the narrative and the cognitive work is enough because it's still in one's brain. Sure. And what I'm what I think and I think from what you explained it is an inter- it is a somatic uh physical internalized trauma. So that's why I think you do also have to do deep work, breathing work, going very deep into your body. And bringing into your consciousness and, you know, it, it, there are people who can help you do this kind of very deep work to, 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 to physically heal as well. And it's back to when you said, oh, I look well. I think it's because we're in such a muddle about mental health because we split them. We think mind's here and body's there. You've got to do both. So Rene Descartes, 17th century French scientist, he gives us the word Cartesian, the Cartesian model is the split of mind and body. And most healthcare is still split mind and body. Everything we've been talking about is how the the one and the same. The physical symptoms of psychological distress, the psychological... So this is... Well, that is, it's interesting that you talk about it in that way because you're bang on the money. Yet we have such obvious examples that if I feel sad, I cry. Yeah, so I, feel, I know. I feel something or I've watched something on a movie that's made me cry. How did I get a physical reaction to what I watched? It, that's an everyday thing that every yeah, single Yeah, you say person... you're, you're sick with worry. Yeah. Well, I did a whole bloody book about nutrition and mental health because I became really interested in the mind-body connection. And, you and know, carrot what... cake makes you happy. That's what all you've learned, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> well, what I would say is if you... And I run a lot of good mood food <laughs> workshops. If you, if you are interested in that desire for a treat and a sweet something like a piece of carrot cake. Having the carrot cake itself is less damaging to your health than guilt tripping and spending the next three hours feeling anxious that you had the carrot cake. Mm-hmm. So by all means, have the carrot cake, but have it with focus and enjoyment. The problem is... Stay was that- with that bit and leave that because I want to talk about that in a bit more detail. Let's just stay <laughs> on this bit and finish this, this yes, bit we're on right sorry, now. sorry, I know. We're going into easier territory the, on yeah, nutrition. Then That's much easier. The, the deep work, okay, so I, yeah. I, I have been on a hypnotherapy course. Sure. And so I, I learned to, to become a hypnotherapist. Nice. Until a certain point. What's it called where you're the baby in the womb? Oh, yeah, I yeah, uh, I know. I did a thing called the Hoffman thinking... course, which is all about that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, so trying to, trying to bring somebody's pre-life experiences or life in the womb experiences Yeah, no, out. that's a bit beyond me. That, that was, I, I got to that point, and at that point I'm like, guys, this is yeah. it's bananas. Yeah. The rest of it I was really happy with, now it's bananas. But go, going into, <laughs> you've got a story you've created. Mm-hmm. That's given you some physical symptoms. Sure. That story may or may not be real. Okay. Yeah. Now what we need to do is to is to get inside our heads and mm-hmm. find a way of taking that story yeah. and turning it into something either less painful without physical effects or destroying it altogether, whichever mm-hmm. needs to be done. Do you want me to tell you how you're going to do that? I'm about to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we do that? Okay. So here's how I've managed to line up mind and body in a way that the positive stories that I'm thinking in my mind are lining up with a positive bodily experience. So there's the clue. If, for example... You said to me, right, Rachel, we're going to have dinner tonight. I have become so in tune with my body, which I may tell you, through all my depression, I never gave myself the time of day in terms of 
being present in my body and all the mindfulness techniques that everybody knows about do help to be present in my body. If I was asked out for dinner by you, okay, what I would That'd now nice do... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a bad example. Let's think of somebody we don't like. Uh, yeah, because because what I now do is I would then say, thought-wise, I'd really like to have dinner with Spencer tonight. I'm so attuned now to this connection between mind and body that I know if I'm lining up with what I want to do. If, if, if it's something I want to do, I feel relaxed, I feel light, I feel at ease physically, I feel calm. I naturally, even a gentle smile will start. I always say it in a positive way. I would like to have dinner with Spencer. Now, I'm, as I say, I've become so sensitized to this connection, which I do think is at the heart now of good mental health, is understanding this connection and becoming self-aware and teaching yourself to be in your body and your mind rather than one or the other. If I were to say, uh, let's, I mean, I'm getting in a muddle because it would be fun to have dinner with you, but let's think of someone I don't <laughs> want to have dinner with. Who do I not like? I can't think of anybody. <laughs> okay, exactly. I would love to have dinner with Hitler. Look at me. I mean, I'm so ill at ease physically and I'm so aware of my physicality that... I'm now able to line up with what I want actually to do. And it's nothing to do with anybody else. It's not because I'm going to get a gold star because I have dinner with Spencer. It's just because that's what I want to do. And it's not because anybody's going to affirm me. And it's not for any reason other than I'm actually lining up with my true desire. And it is, for me, about putting this mind and body together and, you know, challenging some of these stories which I used to have which I feel good when I don't believe those stories why why do I want to believe those stories anymore they make me feel sick literally they made me feel sick I was never good enough at the times I remember one day one day in the newsroom I wrote seven stories for the paper I had seven bylines in that day's paper it's unheard of but it didn't actually make me feel good you know, obviously it destroyed my health. So, yeah, I think that for me, I mean, you know, it, it's years and years of work to have got to this place of self-awareness and using all the techniques that I've, I've written about. But that's, I think, really what, what, what has been the breakthrough. People used to get red letters in the post, hmm. an envelope that was a final demand on a bill. Yeah. And that's become an email now. Mm. And they, the letter would come and they wouldn't open the letter. Mm. Or they'd tear it up or they'd put it somewhere because they didn't want to deal with it because facing it sure. would, would literally give them anxiety. Sure. I get that with WhatsApps. Really? Well, they make you feel really anxious. I don't even want to open them. I wonder what that's about. And I get... I mean, I'll probably get 200 WhatsApps a day. Ah. But there'll be, there'll be some that literally I don't even need to open it and mm. I feel awful. Makes so, me feel, when, yeah. I, when I open it, it's nothing as bad as I thought it yeah. would be, but I feel, I feel okay, sick. Okay, so that, that's related to what I'm saying. So mm. I've given you the positive spin about kind of lining up when you're feeling at ease. Yeah. I, keep, I love that word. Just keep coming back to that. But it's not that... I'm not, obviously, I have moments when I feel sick with fear and I feel sad. You know, I, we were chatting earlier, one of our children's not being well. I mean, obviously, I, I'm not like a, you know, this happy bunny going around all the time and everything's tickety-boo every second of the day. But again, that, that awareness of our somatic experience. So if, if there's one or two people, for example, I have a real charge, there's a woman I worked with and we had a big falling out and it took me about 10 years not to see her and really feel sick. But now when I get that feeling or you with your WhatsApp, I would stay with it. So what we resist persists. So I would allow it. I would acknowledge it. I would be aware of it. Here's the fear. Okay, be with it. Stay with it. And actually, if you use some of the breathing techniques, so back to the mind-body link, so you physically bring down your 
your threat level and you, you you use some of the breathing to get back into a kind of, you know, more relaxed state and you allow it and you acknowledge it and, okay, here I'm feeling frightened, I'm feeling frightened, it goes remarkably more quickly than if you resist it and fight it. Because, of course, once you resist it and fight it, that's what I was doing when I was so ill. Oh, my God, what's happening to me? So I was in this kind of battle to the, literally to the death. Whereas if I had said to myself, OK, you know, I'm stressed. There's some reasons I might be stressed. It is a lot to hold down a room in the newsroom at the Times and have two children and have a husband at Goldman Sachs. Stay with it, allow it, you know, no, not panic. We haven't really talked about medication, but it is complicated because once you're on medication, it's very hard to know what your true response is is, and whether the medication may or may be helping or providing side effects, and that can confuse that self-awareness. So I'm not saying no to medication. It can be life-saving for lots of people. But for me, it came with a lot of side effects, which it took me a long time because I was on medication for a long time. So it took me a long time to get into this different way of being, really. Sorry, that was rather a lot of a download, wasn't it? No, that was really good. It's given me lots to think about. I look at I look at um, antidepressant medication as being like a Viagra tablet that takes three months to work. Mm. Because when it does work, you don't know if it's the Viagra or whether it's actually you. Exactly. Exactly. It's so tricky. And I, I've become more interested in... Yeah, just just believing in my own agency and ability to make a difference. And that in itself is a fabulous feeling. But when you think about most medications, you know, why do people pop the pill for whatever it might be? It's because they want to fix something now. Mm. So headache, wallop, that goes in there. I've got a neurofen, paracetamol, whatever. Yeah. My headache's going to go in the next 20 minutes. Migraine, migra leave, wallop in there. That'll go, go and sit in a dark room for half an hour. <clears throat> Any form of medication that takes weeks, oh, wow. if not months, yeah. to, to have impact it means that you have to start with some form of blind faith that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. You don't know how long before it works and you don't know if it is working or whether you're working. So that you, you've you nailed it. I remember psychiat the first psychiatrist who looked after me, he said, he said, you will get better. And I said, oh, is it the drugs that are going to make me better? And he said, well, we won't ever know for sure. You might have got better anyway. How am I? How can you know? That's the problem with with psychological health. Well, then, then is there's it, no blood test. There's no brain scan. Has anyone found out what's actually in this medication? Maybe it's not medication. Maybe maybe it's, it's a, just a placebo. Or, yeah, yeah. Maybe well, maybe yeah. it is. You think about it. You've got this medication that's going to take ages to work. How how do we not know? How do we know? I mean, that's because I was diagnosed as clinically depressed. I was suicidal. I nearly killed myself one day. I planned it all out, all this all this stuff. So I've been on a journey myself. I just, so I have a huge amount of empathy for anybody that's been mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in any form of dark place, regardless. I also was, diag uh, was prescribed three times antidepressants. And mm -hmm. three times I took the first tablet. Mm -hmm. So literally in the packet, whatever they came in each time, I took the first tablet and I was like, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. And I never took another one. Mm -hmm. Because it was this, no, you need this medication. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you mm -hmm. to, but I need help now. Mm. But now. I need it now. Yeah. I think, I think when I was in hospital and things, I didn't, I, I mean, I, once you're in the system, once you're in with a psychiatrist and you can't really, your own sort of free will kind of goes out the window, really. Well, maybe our story is very similar. I was in the Priory mm -hmm. uh, in Chelmsford in Essex. Mine was the Charter Nightingale, if you know okay. that. Yeah. So, and what you said earlier was quite profound to me because the reason I didn't take my life was because the psychiatrist taught me to understand the impact it would have on my kids. Right. Yeah. And my kids were small back then. And it was that alone, nothing else 
made any difference. Mm. But the thought, because in my head it was, they have a stepfather. I have enough money for all of them for the rest of their lives. That's all taken care of. So I haven't got a money worry. They've got a stepfather who's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. What do they need me for? Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd positioned it in a nice way in my mind to say that they don't actually need me. It was the psychiatrist that taught me to understand they do mm -hmm. that stopped me making the decision. Didn't take, didn't stop my depression, didn't make me feel any better, just stopped me jumping off the building. Because it's interesting because when we were chatting earlier, you were talking about keeping going. Mm -hmm. and I didn't get better at all. I mean, I still felt incredibly ill for, for months after months after months. Mm -hmm. and the one thing I kept saying to everyone is, when am I going to get better? When am I going to get better? That was like, I was like a sort of on repeat. I mean, I was like a... But, but, it, um, but, I, but I kept going. I, I kept with it because, because of the children. But, but, me, but me too. It took yeah. years. Yeah. You know, people, people would talk about my depression in 2013... Yeah. Okay, they would talk about that. But yeah. I, 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 for sure, three or four years ago, still had it profoundly. Yeah. yeah now, gosh. I'd learned not to talk about it like I talked about it before or cause alarm or that kind of stuff. But yeah. I still had very, very, <clears throat> very, very dark times. And yeah. I, I've got, it's funny, really, I've, I've been left, um, I feel like it's almost like a kind of great... Um, like a, a kind of river went out to the sea and I've got little, little sort of bits of stone, little piles sort of left of where the major depression was. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Mornings are still a bit tricky. A lot of people who are anxious are quite anxious first thing in the morning. I don't know if you've got that. I wake up at 4.30, go to the gym at 5. Right, OK. And if I don't do that, I have what you, you just described. Right. And I'm, so most I, I people who it. are kind of anxiety-driven, depressive, they're better in the evening. I mean, get me at 10 o'clock and I'm just like, whatever. Really? <laughs> You're on no, fire. I'm fine now because I've done all this work. So, But I still have a little bat squeak in the morning and just have to remind myself. You know, I was talking about that allowing and being with that fear. So I can wake and I'll have that momentary ah, panic, you know, but I allow it, be with it, breathe through it, allow it, allow, allow it, and then, you know, it's much better. So that's still a little bat squeak. And the other one I have is I'm, I'm a very nervous traveller. I will get to the station two trains before. <laughs> and as for flying, honestly, I mean, you know, I, I, that's the only time I still, I do carry medication. I will have some diazepam. It, turbulence and a flight, and you can tell me a million times that it's just, you know, the air pressure, blah, blah, blah. But I am not, and, and that is the nearest I go back to being like I was when I was in such a state. And and it's that same, in fact, if anybody wants to know what severe depression is, I always say, it's like you're on a plane and it's going to be an emergency landing and you're like this in the crash position and your stomach's all over the place and your head's racing, and but it doesn't stop. That's what it's like. So on a plane, I can get a little squeak of it. But, you know, my husband's very lovely and I'll sit there. It's very good for our marriage, actually. Because <laughs> I love him so much after the plane because he's so he's very calm and it doesn't get to him. Mm. And then I feel so lucky that I am married to somebody who is there for me. It's nice. Yeah. Okay, there's two two more things to talk about. Number one, um, leaders yeah. in business and how they – and how culturally like it was for you, if it is uh, – if there is still a stigma attached to it, what, 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 what should they do to find ways to deal with the – whether it's demons or dark days? What kind of approaches do you think these people should have? Or what, what kind of approaches do you think companies should – put in place what procedures should they put in place to try and help people well you've got to talk about it i mean it's pretty obvious isn't it i mean maybe i'm i'm sort of dragging banging my own drum here but experience expertise the word expertise comes from experience you've got to hear from people who have experienced this sort of stuff the reason you've got to hear from them is because unless you can properly hear how serious it is. I mean, this is why I've become a, you know, mental health advocate and I'm ambassador for Rethink and Sane and all the other stuff that I do. Because 
It's very hard for people to understand what a serious thing it is when things really go wrong. If you can hear from people who've been through it, you'll realise how high the stakes are. And it's not a trivial matter. It's absolutely life-threatening. In terms of business leaders, the single highest risk category, which I'm sure you already know, is middle-aged men between 50 and 55. And they're often doing very well, supposedly. So to understand the seriousness of what's going on. So I would say people in positions of leadership need to hear from people who've been through this sort of stuff to realise why it matters so much. And I think when people hear from other people who've been through it, uh, they automatically, it's almost like you don't then have to persuade them. They understand it matters. And I think that understanding, we've talked a lot today about the sort of mind-body links. I think a really helpful thing is understanding the physicality of it because sort of that is something people can understand. And and if you're a leader, you can understand that if you personally are suffering from insomnia, uh, you know, um, nausea, um, all the other, you know, um, um, uh, racing thoughts, all, all the physical things that go with depression and severe anxiety, of course you're not going to be tip-top functioning in your job. So I think, first of all, the seriousness, secondly, understanding the physical impact. And it's not like if you if you just packaged it up and said serious mental health problems are as bad as cancer or, um, I don't know, Parkinson's or something that everybody would understand straight away it would be completely, you know, terrible for your business. People would understand that. Um, in fact, I remember when I was researching all this area, there, there was a really interesting guy who was, used to be head of the Royal College of GPs. He had had cancer and a coronary heart attack. He said the physical pain of depression was worse than either of those. So understanding so, the worst... Say that again. So he was, the, he was called Dr John Horder. He was head of the Royal College of GPs and he'd had a coronary heart attack and he'd had cancer. And he said the physical pain of... He'd also had de severe depression. The physical pain of severe depression was worse. So to, to sort of understand that physicality of the illness, which I think my first book, Black Rainbow, um, you know, got quite a reception. And I think it was because I tried to explain that point. And the third thing I'd say to leaders, so one, the seriousness, two, the physicality, but three, there's so much you can do. There's so much you can do to look after your psychological health. And we were talking earlier about all the different approaches and what works for people and you know, whether that's exercise or nutrition or getting your story in order about what narratives you believe or going back to your childhood or recognising your childhood trauma or moving on from outward approval or changing the premises of your life or all the things that we've been talking about. There's so, so much you can do, which is fabulous because some illnesses, there's nothing you can do. Parkinson's, there's nothing you can do. Mental health, there is so much you can do. And, you know, it's fabulous when you feel great. Ask for more. Last question. I, um, I like all things with sugar in. They're amazing. I like everything that's cake baked. I like <laughs> ice cream more than anything else in the world. In fact, my friends take me to restaurants to, to taste the ice cream. I like it that much. Even though I eat healthy. Mm -hmm. Um and I do eat it really healthy, I do love all of those things. Mm -hmm. Now, I've learnt to keep them to Saturday night, <laughs> yeah, which is my kind of like cheat moment. But when it comes to anxiety and depression, how impactful is food on those two issues? I think it's massive. And I think it's a big thing that's happening in mental health. So there's... Um, I did in my own book called The Happy Kitchen, Good Mood Food. But if you want another book, Professor Edward Bullmore, he's the professor of psychiatry at Cambridge, and he did a book called The Inflamed Mind. And everyone's trying to figure out what's going on when someone's really depressed or anxious. And one theory, which they haven't got a whole load of evidence for, but they're looking at is this idea of inflammation. So underpinning a lot of mood disorders is this idea we've got an inflamed system. Now, that is why food is so important, because there are 
ways to bring down inflammation. Stress is a big contributor to inflammation. So all the other things I've been talking about, about changing your headspace, are hugely important. But food is a lovely one to help with inflammation. So I remember seeing my GP and she said, how are you getting on? I said, I'm doing the mindfulness, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, blah, blah, blah. I've got the therapy, blah, blah, blah. And then she wrote, got out her prescription and, and she said, I'm going to write out three happy foods and you should try them. So there were dark green leafy vegetables, oily fish, so that's your tuna, herring, mackerel, that kind of thing, and dark chocolate, which would be my answer, by the way, to the need for the sugar rush, is don't fight it because the more you fight it, if you're told you can't have something, you want it. So the trick on nutritional interventions is to go for adding things in because our brains work that will fight what we're told not to do. You know, don't don't read it. What are you going to do? You're going to read it. Don't eat it. You're going to eat it. So you've got to work with your psychology. But those three interventions, the oily fish, the dark green leafy vegetables and the dark chocolate, all of them are about improving your gut health. So this is the idea of the mind-body link, the vagus nerve that runs from your head to your stomach, back from your stomach to your head. And they all help with gut health and lowering inflammation, which helps with physical health, which helps with mental health. And it's a lovely intervention. So I do other things. You know, I'm a big believer in poetry. I did a book about the healing power of poetry because I think the language is important, the language you talk to yourself. I did a book, We'll Never Walk Alone, about lovely, consoling poems. That's back to your headspace. So everybody that's watching and listening right now, there's a shameless book plug just taking place. <laughs> so I we'll, we'll, in we'll give the it end. a shameless book plug, okay? <laughs> this is one of Rachel's books, okay? It's called You'll Never Walk Alone, Poems for Life's Ups and Downs. So if you don't have a copy, get one. Make her happy and it'll make this plug worth it. But I don't need your outward <laughs> affirmation, but still, that is very sweet of you, Spencer. But yeah, but the nutritional stuff, look, poetry's not for everyone, but everyone's got to eat three times a day. It's back to that agency, finding a power inside yourself, because I'm not denying the importance of doctors and psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists, all of them. I've had huge help from all of them. But back to Spencer's main relationship is with Spencer. And you can look after Spencer three times a day by nourishing yourself, looking after yourself and, you know, adding in things that are going to help lower that inflammation, improve your gut health, improve your mental health. Rachel Kelly, what an absolute joy it's been talking <laughs> to you. I think you're fabulous. You say that to all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really, really enjoyable talking to you. Yeah, thanks likewise. for sparing the time and thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, well, my pleasure. I'm going to really think about a lot of things you said as well. That's what's so amazing. There's always more to learn, right? Always. Thank you.